Hello and welcome to On the Record. It's been almost 30 years since the first modern case of abduction by aliens was reported. Then, as now, the topic has generated scorn and ridicule, but very little serious research and investigation. My guest today might be called the father of the abduction hypothesis. It was his first book, Missing Time, that triggered intense nationwide, even worldwide interest in the field. His second book, Intruders, lent even more credibility to a topic that needs all it can get. Bud Hopkins, thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, to begin with, in the, in, the, uh, in the preface of Intruders, you say, right off the bat, you're not going to believe a lot of this. Uh, you compare it to the Nazi concentration camps and how uh, the mind, the human mind, just can't accept things that are out of uh, a certain realm. Why is that? Well, I think that uh, we've lived with a kind of range of possibility around us, which we all understand and are familiar with. Uh, we don't understand how when that range of possibilities is radically expanded that it becomes a little terrifying. Look what happened almost to Galileo and uh, Copernicus when the simple argument was made that uh, the sun was uh, the center of our particular solar system instead of vice versa. Uh, they almost lost their lives for making that kind of assertion. This is the ultimate Copernican revolution because the evidence suggests beyond any doubt as far as I'm concerned that uh, we're being visited by some kind of some form of intelligence which is higher than ours and some kind of technology which is higher than ours and it is able to pick up human beings at will uh, as objects of study the way we might uh, a lesser species and uh, diddle with their memories their ability to recall uh, physical uh, operations take place which leave physical marks on their bodies there's uh, an extensive interest in human genetics uh, this seems to be the core of the whole thing. To admit all of those things as possibility, um, as a real possibility, is to be staggered. So we keep it at arm's length conveniently, but it does, uh, I think, upset more and more people as they see the evidence for it. You're not a scientist, but you are as close as we get to an expert on this topic. Explain your credentials, how you got started, and and uh, and why you have become something of an expert on this. Well, I'm essentially a painter and sculptor. I'm an artist. Uh, and. Uh, I got involved in this whole strange subject by the fact of having a UFO sighting myself in the daytime with a couple of friends in 1964. And up until that time, I was fully convinced that the Air Force had said they were balloons or something or other. I never knew what, and I accepted that. But then when we saw this thing flying around, it's a long story in itself, uh, I was very aware that, okay, there's something up there that has not been explained. And I began looking into it very thoroughly and reading about it. And ultimately, a man I'd known for many, many years told me about this thing landing near his car and little men getting out and taking soil samples. Uh, he was quite terrified as he was telling me the story. And I, all he knew about me was that I was uh, a, a neighbor and a customer in his store, not that I had any interest in the subject. And I looked into that case. It occurred right across the Hudson River from Manhattan in a park in New Jersey. And I found other witnesses to the whole thing from other points of view. And I published an article about it in a New York newspaper. And I concealed deliberately certain details about the UFO, its color, certain details about the weather condition, because I wanted to, I, I was convinced that there were other witnesses. And I wanted to have some way of checking their veracity. And in fact, we got something like seven or eight other witnesses who were right about these missing details. And so I knew, all right, these things are flying around. They're going on. Uh, the, the, the whole business is going on. And as I began to look further, I ran into more and more abduction cases, and I simply followed where the evidence led. And I used my best judgment. I think all of us have uh, a kind of innate uh, common sense about this sort of thing, about how to go about conducting the examination. There is a pattern, I guess you could say, a typical abduction. Tell me what the pattern, what it entails. The pattern, uh, well, essentially, a person is abducted first as a tiny child, uh, the way we might pick up a a pup from some seal or something uh, that we're going to follow. That uh, child is very often uh, then cut very often at the leg, the back of the leg, from the leg, uh, as if a layer of cells are being removed systematically. And that leaves two kinds of scars, either a circular scoop mark, which I see over and over again, a depression, uh, which is perfectly round or oval, uh, or a straight line cut and there's no bleeding and no pain, and the mother is very upset when she notices this on her child, especially if, if it's, say, it's up the back of the leg and the child is wearing pants and, and the mother that night uh, undresses the child, there's no tear in the pants, and here's this cut, and it's associated with the child having been missing. Well, anyway, that kind of uh, uh, incident in childhood is 
very often one of the very first experiences that people have, abduction experiences. Then it's as if they're tracked through life. Uh, there are many, many people who report a needle with a tiny ball on the end, which is inserted up the nostril, breaks through up in here, hurts. When the needle comes out, there's no little ball on the end, as if an implant has been put in place. Sometimes that needle goes in uh, in the eye socket, under the eyeball, or in the ear. And uh, there's a lot of physical evidence to support this, although we, to my knowledge, we do not have one of these objects in our possession, but we certainly have the traces of them, and they have turned up on MRIs which is a magnetic resonant imaging. It's a process that hospitals use. Uh, and then that person in later years uh, is uh, sampled further in, in terms of reproductive cells. Ova and sperm samples are taken. And uh, the whole project is as if that person's bloodline is being followed, studied uh, in depth. It's a very complicated story, but uh, this is the pattern that we run into over and over again. And it's sometimes the family is followed for generations. Exactly. And incidentally, George, we're dealing with, not with the, you know, the, the proverbial man in the pickup truck and the bib overalls in the middle of a field somewhere. Uh, I've worked with uh, abductees, one of whom is a NASA scientist. Uh, I've had now three psychiatrists come to me uh, to help, to have me help them through hypnosis and otherwise recall their own abduction experiences. I've had police officers. I've had uh, military personnel. I was dealing with an army officer of, of very high security clearance recently who was an abductee. Doctors, nurses, scientists, housewives, you, you name it, whatever it is. Uh, and, and incidentally, some people who were uh, nationally known in, in uh, uh, the entertainment field and so on. And yet most of these people want anonymity. They do not want ridicule. They do not want their names used. They do not want publicity. They are very frightened by what's happened to them. Is there a common denominator, or is they just picked at random? Do you get a feeling for it? Uh, it when you think that they're picked as tiny children, uh, let's say maybe one year old, <laughs> two years old, uh, the accent seems to be on the genetic material rather than any kind of personal uh, qualities, which are hard to know in a one-year-old child. But it's very interesting that the psychologists, uh, and this is one of the very first objective studies that was ever done, uh, we commissioned a psychologist to test some abductees without telling the psychologist that these people had reported these experiences. We said, we're looking for patterns. What do these people share? We're also looking for psychopathology. And it turns out that there was no heavy duty mental illness or psychopathology with any of the nine. But the pattern that turned up was very interesting. She said, all of them showed a lower, lowered self-esteem. These are people who were uh, very capable in many respects, happy lives and good lives and so forth, but their so self-esteem level was way down. They felt somewhat ill at ease with their physical body, with their sexuality and so forth, somewhat separate from that. And they felt a uh, higher uh, degree of suspicion and they had more trouble t uh, trusting other people and making uh, relationships work and so forth. And when we told her uh, that uh, these people were reporting these abduction experiences, she said, well, the, the, her tests showed that there was no psychopathology present with any of these nine that would explain these accounts as some sort of psychological aberration. And she said, though it doesn't, the, uh, nothing proves that they had the experiences. She said, if they had had these experiences, these are exactly the sorts of problems you would find as with rape victims. And this is a species of rape in a certain sense. You mentioned genetics. That's mm -hmm. what it seems to be. Is there some kind of genetic pattern that, that's, that's consistent? Uh, we don't really know enough to answer that one way or the other. How many people are we talking about? Now, you've had to have dealt with hundreds of, of cases already, but this is not just a limited to the United George, States. George, it's enormous. And that's one of the most upsetting aspects of the whole thing. Uh, it's enormous number. There's an enormous number of people who have been through this experience uh, and who are having recurring abduction experiences. I don't know how it operates on this scale. I don't know how they can do it, but they're doing it. Mass delusion possibility or mass uh, almost indoctrination. You know, there, there's, we've all seen the alien pictures and the alien yeah. movies now. Uh, is That could be a function in some of the cases. Could be, but uh, the experiences uh, are, the people I've worked with, the experiences I'm convinced are genuine experiences. Uh, these are not fantasies. <clears throat> it's very easy to tell, actually. Uh, although one could be fooled, I'm sure. I don't want to, you know. Uh, but, but the point is that it's happened to a huge number of people. It's an extremely upsetting uh, situation because 
We have looked at UFOs for years. We have tried to uh, uh, get take pictures of them, and many wonderful pictures in this new book, especially that, that on the Gulf Breeze. Uh, they turn up on radar. We have followed them around and chased them and so forth. And uh, we never wanted to face what they were really up to. And as uh, a friend of mine uh, said very wittily, he said, it took us uh, 30 years before we could admit these things had an inside. Uh, it was just a kind of an object. Tracking them and trying to uh, photograph them, study them, get uh, drawings of their exterior, etc., was a little bit like trying to get the license plate number on the getaway car without having figured out what the crime was. Well, the crime is that they're interested in us, and they're not asking anyone's permission. They are picking up children. There are some horrifyingly sad stories. Uh, children, one little girl pleaded with her mother recently to, to strap her into her stroller, not put her in bed, and put her in the hallway where there were no windows so she could sleep there because in her bedroom she had seen these little people come in the window. She had been taken out the window. They had hurt her, etc. And there were physical marks on this child. It's, it's not a pleasant uh, phenomenon to deal with. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with more of On the Record. Welcome back. We're talking with Bud Hopkins about the abduction hypothesis. I guess it's more than a hypothesis from, from your experience. Uh, a lot of folks say it's movies, it's things like that, that that condition people to, and that's why they all have the same vision of these aliens with big heads and everything. But it's worldwide, isn't it? So yes. It's not just American phenomenon. Exactly. And on top of that, of course, the uh, the, the, the only film version that really was widespread that looks like the alien drawings to, to a great extent is the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And of course, those aliens were based on drawings that Alan Hynek of the Center for UFO Studies had given to Spielberg so that his people could try to be accurate about the, what an alien is supposed to look like. We have cases from, uh, uh, I have a case from uh, the Catskill Mountains that has certain details, it's an abduction, that only turned up in, an, in a case in Zimbabwe. Uh, southern Africa and, and we have situations there where people uh, simply report exactly what we report here. They'll describe the figures and the ships the same way except that they fold it into their uh, belief systems and say well those are the ghosts of our ancestors. And there was a wonderful story on that where the, the, the man described the silver suits, the, the pale white skin and of course he was a dark-skinned uh, African and he said they were the ghosts of the ancestors. And the investigator said, how could that be? It would have looked different. And the clothing. And he said, well, I don't know. He said, times change. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, uh, let's talk about some specific cases. The most disturbing or perhaps uh, exhilarating or most revealing case that you've ever worked with, in a nutshell. Well, I think that the Kathy Davis case uh, that I wrote about in Intruders was uh, the most important case I've looked into because it was the first case I was able to follow through the uh, genetic aspect of uh, the abduction um, in the sense that she had been evidently abducted, artificially inseminated. I know this sounds off the wall to our viewers, but it's going on. And uh, later re-abducted and the developing fetus was removed. Uh, and uh, in, she remembered little pieces of this in her real life. Suddenly she wasn't pregnant anymore. and. Uh, the wildest part of this is that years later she was reabducted and shown a small child. You, you've written about something called wise baby dreams. What is a wise baby dream? Well, it's, uh, these are essentially dreams that uh, probably are either real experiences that are remembered as dream because they're dreamlike. Uh, they're remembered in the guise of dreams, but they would be uh, uh, experiences where people are being shown these tiny children. The most bizarre thing about this totally bizarre phenomenon is that there seems to be uh, a goal to create on the part of the UFO occupants to create a hybrid species between them and us and they then want us to somehow interact with these tiny little uh, strange looking half human babies figures uh, children uh, this um, and and they seem to need the bonding they want us to hold these tiny children it seems totally crazy and so forth. Yet, in the most recent, uh, one of the most recent cases I have, a little boy has had several abduction experiences. He's six years old and, uh, of course, needless to say, has not read Intruders or anything else. But uh, he, and he's come back with physical marks. He's been missing. Sometimes the child turns up out in the front yard in the middle of the night with all the doors locked. 
So they're being taken. But at any rate, this little boy said that he's been made to, to play with these strange little children who uh, have big heads and uh, they don't have much hair, but the hair they do have is white. And uh, he doesn't like them because they don't understand his games and he doesn't understand their games. But he's evidently being taken and put in a context with... To socialize. To socialize. I don't know what all of this means, but uh, one can't dismiss the reports because they sound so outrageous. It's so weird. It certainly is. Uh, the Gulf Breeze case, you mentioned that briefly. Uh, everyone knows there were pictures taken, but I don't think everyone is familiar that there was an abduction There are many. There have been there. many abduction experiences uh, connected with the Gulf Breeze uh, series of cases. Whenever there are UFO reports and they're down low and people see UFOs closely, they're not just flying around, they're doing something. They are busy with uh, human beings. Uh, one of the Gulf Breeze cases, which is very interesting, is that a mother, uh, when she came uh, back to the, well, when she turned on the television set and it was a, one of the photographs of Gulf Breeze was being shown, uh, her little child collapsed in terror and said, Mommy, that's the thing that's in the backyard that took me, that I go into when the little people come. And uh, this child has gone through a tremendous terror. The mother described to me herself waking up and seeing, standing in the doorway of the kitchen, this little figure. She was paralyzed, unable to move. It was ultimately an abduction experience on her own. This is right in the Gulf Breeze area. And one of those little telling details, I said, how tall was the figure? And she said, Mr. Hopkins, he came right up to the microwave. And when you hear a detail like that, you know, it's, it's something the woman's was looking at. This was not something that the mind invented for her. Uh, physical evidence, other than the scars. There Phys is other physical evidence. There is other physical evidence. First of all, uh, we have on CAT scans and MRIs uh, spots which suggest uh, in, in, that these objects, these little implants, are near the uh, uh, optic nerves. But no They're way to get place. them out. No way to get them out. Very, very dangerous. I have uh, some radiologists and a neurosurgeon who have been advising me in all of this. They're extremely intrigued. Maybe we need to wait for somebody to die. That well, one. that's one of the more morbid sides of this, but there's truth in that attitude, actually, that idea. Uh, a second thing is we have on the ground many times, especially in the, the uh, uh, case I read about intruders, I, when a UFO comes down, it doesn't seem to always happen, but sometimes, uh, the grass is killed. Uh, it is the soil is baked to a kind of rock-like hardness and uh, we don't know what does that but uh, there is a circle of absolutely dead grass and absolutely rock-like soil uh, which will not then uh, support life uh, you can test it by taking a sample of it and then control soil from two feet outside the circle uh, put seeds in them water them and so forth you get nothing from it's as if it's been sterilized now we have th something like 2,000 cases like this and we cannot duplicate it in the uh, laboratory. We can't take some of the control soil, put it in a microwave or heat it or do anything to it to get it to this particular degree of hardness and sterility. We don't know what the energy sources are that are causing this effect, but you have to say we have a phenomenon here that, that absolutely requires investigation. Any other physical manifestations? Well, of course, they can turn up on radar very frequently and they can be photographed. And we have videotapes, films, we have uh, we have every kind of evidence that one could imagine, except, presumably, we don't know what the government is holding, but uh, whatever branch of the government is involved in this, but we have everything you could possibly want except, presumably, a piece of a UFO. And as Alan Hynek used to say, I mean, you and I don't have a piece of a UFO or an implant, but as Alan Hynek used to say, uh, you know, 747s are flying over the outback of Australia every day, and the Aborigines look up, and none of them have a piece of one you know, uh, but uh, they know <laughs> what they're seeing. These things are there, and uh, the evidence is, uh, is enormous uh, in its complexity. And uh, one of the details, just a quick thing, I've been collecting uh, drawings that people have made of a notational system, it would seem, numbers, letters, whatever, that they see inside UFOs uh, on a wall or a page or something. And they're virtually identical. Uh, they have never been published, obviously. They're one of my ways of being able to test the veracity of a new witness. But I've had a situation once where, uh, recently, where a woman uh, made these drawings. She had remembered what she'd seen in the UFO. She'd remembered under hypnosis and, and partially normally. Uh, made the drawings, and I was so stunned, I showed her a couple of other people's drawings, too, at that point, to show 
It was exactly the same. And she took one look at the other drawings and burst into tears because she was not ready for this to be so real. Okay, we're going to take another short break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We have a few minutes left with Bud Hopkins. What's the, uh, what's the general opinion of the scientific community about this stuff? I mean, has there ever been a, a purely scientific study or any big name scientists ever look at this stuff? Well, uh, there are a lot of big name scientists who are extremely interested in this, but do it in a sub rosa way simply because they're worried about their reputations. Uh, this is uh, that kind of a problem. I'm right now working with two uh, major psychiatrists who are extremely interested in this because they recognize the validity of, of the accounts that these people are coming up with. It's sad it's something that important that you can't, can't work out on it out in the open. Well, I can say that uh, year by year, month by month, more and more people are coming out and talking about this on a serious level. And I, there are a few things, I think, coming up within the next uh, six or eight months that are going to be helpful on just exactly this level. There's still a tremendous bias against it. Now, the interesting thing about this is that most people believe the Gallup poll show. Most people believe that, that uh, UFOs are physically real rather than imaginary. That's what the polls say. But the same, the, the different poll also shows that those same people believe that other people don't believe that UFOs are physically real. In other words, it's an unpopular idea. Yet uh, we have uh, found connections between, uh, without any doubt, between accepting this as a serious problem of study and legitimate area of scientific research and the educational level of the people answering the questions. One of the big problems some people have with the whole f field is the use of hypnosis, uh, that it may be that as a tool it's over-exaggerated, that there have been abuses in how it's approached. Uh, your defense of hypnosis. Well, essentially we have the most important thing to start with is, is between uh, 20 and 30 percent of all the cases we have, people remember them without hypnosis. Uh, some of the most famous cases, the uh, Travis Walton case, the Charles Hickson, Pascagoula case, many, many cases where uh, they remember it all without hypnosis. So what you're remembering under hypnosis it is exactly the same as what uh, turns up <clears throat> in, in uh, just normal recall. Uh, I think that all the tape recordings that I have of my hypnotic sessions, I would certainly uh, defend, uh, I, mean, I would certainly allow somebody to listen to one of those tape recordings if they had any suspicion that uh, witnesses are being led or anything of that sort. It is abused by, uh, I think it's a subtle business and not everybody knows how to do it right. That's one of the things that uh, I'm trying to do is to train uh, therapists, uh, psychologists, investigators, and so on in the particular use of hypnosis in these cases. Uh, but I can assure you that uh, uh, people are not being led. Uh, it's, uh, I, I make attempts sometimes to try to lead them in a direction that I know to be false and they immediately uh, say no and back back. One of the other things you're trying to do is help some of the people who've been through this experience. Not That's the center. To get through it. I, you have a new newsletter, the Intruder Newsletter, and the purpose of that. Well, the Intruders Foundation, it's, uh, which, which we use the acronym IF, uh, is a, uh, an organization which is now national uh, of therapists, uh, investigators, psychologists, others who can help people uh, look into their experiences, uh, help them cope with these experiences afterwards, we're setting up support groups. We have a number of support groups in different cities where abductees regularly get together. And we don't talk about the experience itself, but how one handles these things, how one talks to one's children. Uh, Much like a rape crisis center. Exactly. Um, we have about a minute left. Any kind of indication, uh, any kind of common thread in terms of communication alien to human uh, that you hear time and time again. Do they ever say anything like what, what they want to do? Or, no, they uh, don't. You're going to be okay? Or <laughs> Yeah, there's a constant stroking that goes on uh, in the conversation. You'll be fine. We'll bring you home. Everything will be all right. Don't be afraid. You won't be hurt. That kind of thing. The sort of thing a pediatrician tells a six-year-old before he gives him a shot. Uh, that's the central kind of communication we get. All the big questions, there's nothing. There's nothing like where they're from, what the ultimate bottom line is here. Uh, what this is ultimately for. Is this for us? Is this for them? What, what is this all about? Nothing to that in that area and no permission. The basic thing is many people will say if they explain what they're doing and told me why and ask my permission, I might say, okay, I will be part of your experiment here. But ask my permission first and explain yourselves. And we get nothing on those two levels. With 30 seconds, you don't have any theories of your own why they're here. I mean, this hybrid race I think thing, they're, is it? I think they're here because they're in trouble. And I think they need 
some kind of revivification that they can get through a, uh, our genetic richness and variety and so forth. I think they're here because they need us. Bud Hopkins, fascinating stuff. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. See you next week with more on the record.